Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to this time of worship coming to you from the Sudicum Chapel at the First Lutheran Church of Nashville. Thank you for being with us today. This is worship for December 6th, the second Sunday of Advent. Our text is from the Old Testament lesson from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The prophet speaks words of comfort to the people of Israel who find themselves in exile in Babylon. Today is also our annual congregational meeting. It will convene following the in-person worship service at approximately 10.30 a.m. You are invited to participate by Zoom or by telephone. Uh, the appropriate links have been sent by U.S. mail and by means of our email communication over the last couple of weeks. I hope that you will be able to join us for this important meeting as we vote on the proposed budget for 2021 and elect two members to the Congregation Council. Today we also continue our stewardship emphasis, fulfilling God's purpose. This week's theme is witnessing for Jesus. As witnesses for Jesus, we have the opportunity to tell others of the greatest miracle that has ever occurred. The Son of God condescended to come to earth to live as one of us, to be humiliated for the sake of those he loves, and then to rise victoriously, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Through Jesus' resurrection, we can live as forgiven, redeemed people who will spend eternity with him. This resurrection miracle is one to be shouted from the housetops, for it is meant not just for you and me, but for all humankind. Next week's theme in our program, Fulfilling God's Purpose, will be Living as Servants. Please join us in worship and remember that next Sunday, December 13th, is Commitment Sunday, the day which you are invited to make your commitment of support to the ministry we have here at First Lutheran for 2021. I invite you to turn now to the worship pages for December 6th as we begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Today, let us humbly and honestly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Let us pray. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free. Free from all that holds you back and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is the second Sunday in the season of Advent. As we approach the Advent wreath, we light the first candle, the candle of prophecy. We light the second candle, the candle of hope. The prophet Isaiah writes, a voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Come quickly, Lord, and redeem your children. Amen. Come
come and deliver us. O font, font of hope, how long, how long? When will thou come with comfort strong? O come, O come, high heaven God, console us in our way of hope. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, nurture our growth as people of repentance and peace. Amen. now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The first reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. In grand flowing poetic lines, the prophet announces that the exile of God's people in Babylon is over. God will deliver Israel and will care for her as a shepherd cares for his sheep. This word can be trusted because the only enduring reality in life is the word of God. The reading. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the second letter of Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 through 15a. This short letter deals with pressing concerns regarding the final advent of Jesus, especially concerns that could arise over its apparent delay. The author of the letter calls on Christians to anticipate the promised coming of the Lord through conduct dedicated to God. The reading. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. 
since all things will be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. The word of the Lord. Our Holy Gospel for the second Sunday of Advent is from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Gospel of Mark does not begin with the story of Jesus' birth, but with the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The Gospel Lesson. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us begin this sermon time with a word of prayer. Comfort, comfort now my people, tell of peace, so says our God. Comfort those who sit in darkness, Morning under sorrow's load. To God's people now proclaim that God's pardon waits for them. Tell them that their war is over. God will reign in peace forever. Tell them that their war is over. How many people do you know that are still fighting that war? A war perhaps decades old? A war in which their sparring partner has perhaps long since died, and yet they are still fighting the battle. I just love that line. Tell them that their war is over. God will reign in peace all evidence to the contrary. My friends, this draws directly from our Old Testament text from Isaiah. It is a text of lament, but gives us a wonderful way of understanding Advent, especially in a year that has been so different, so challenging. For it has been a year of Advent, a year of waiting, waiting through pandemic, a year of hoping, a year of anticipation. 
And our patience is kind of worn thin, hasn't it? In the midst of this waiting, we long for peace. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. This morning I want to focus on our Old Testament text from Isaiah 40, in which the prophet announces hope and the end of exile. First, let me share some things about the book of Isaiah before we move on. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah are known as First Isaiah. It's from the time before the exile. God sends a prophet to say, uh, hey friends, you might want to change your course. Things aren't going very well. The future is not going to end in a place you want it to be. But the people don't listen. So Isaiah 40 through 55 is in the period of exile and brings a message of comfort to the people in the midst of their lament. Third Isaiah, chapters 56 through 66, anticipates the end of exile. So you go from warning to comfort to rebuilding. And we are in the comfort section in our text today. We are in exile. Now these are the words of the prophet given by God, and there's some debate about the role of the prophet. You might know the phrase, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Some people use that to define what a prophet should do. It's a neat phrase, but it's not biblical. It's not actually even Christian. It is attributed to a Chicago journalist, one Findlay Peter Dunn, back in 1902. And it wasn't originally a positive thing. It was talking about newspapers and the power they wielded over people. It was theologian Martin E. Marty who took it up and applied it to God. But it is apropos. We are in the comfort section to comfort the afflicted. Now, to understand the Hebrew Bible, you must understand that it rests on two pillars. The first is the exodus, and the second is the exile. Without an understanding of those two things, you cannot understand the rest of Hebrew Scripture. Everything stems from those two events. And the exile stems directly from the people's rejection of God. We read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel wanted to anoint his sons as judges to continue the line of judges who ruled Israel, but the sons were corrupt. The people wanted to be ruled over by a king. They said to Samuel, you are old and your sons do not follow your way. Appoint for us a king to govern us like other nations. Well, that's just rude, calling old Samuel old right off the bat. I guess their parents didn't teach them much about respect for their elders. Well, you see, the people saw what was going on in the kingdoms around them, and they thought, this is what we want. We want a king to lead us, a conquering king who will lead us into battle and defeat our neighbors. And this was something God was not doing. He wasn't subjugating, he wasn't conquering, and that's what they wanted. Israel wanted a conquering king. So you see, the monarchy was really based on a rejection of God their rejection of God's kingship over them 
leads to the monarchy, which in turn leads directly to the exile. Well, the people got their wish. Samuel anointed Saul to be king. But after only three kings, Saul, David, and then Solomon, everything went to H-E double hockey sticks in a handbasket because the kings that followed were corrupt. Add to that the fact that Israel was in a very difficult situation on the world stage at that time because little Israel found itself situated between two powerful empires, Egypt and Babylon, who had defeated Assyria. So these powerful empires were fighting for control over everything and everyone, and every time they did battle with one another, Israel was right in the middle. And these two powerful countries came steaming right through Israel and squashed it. In addition, Israel tried to play the two major powers off against one another. And finally, Babylon got tired of it. And to make a long story short, Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem. Siege was a very messy business. And in siege warfare, three things came into play. Famine, disease, and sword. And that's how people died in siege warfare, usually in that order, famine, disease, and sword. And that's what befell Jerusalem after 18 months of siege. They were crushed by Babylon. And in the end, the temple is desecrated and demolished, and people and families were hauled off to Babylon. Imagine watching your city your government buildings, your church being ransacked and destroyed, and then you and your family being taken away like chattel, like property. You've never left your home, you've never left your city before in your life, and suddenly you find yourself in a place far away, as a refugee at least, and possibly as a war criminal at worst. And you wonder, you lament, you cry out, has God rejected us forever? That's exile. And out of that, after 50 years, we hear, Comfort, comfort now my people, tell of peace, so says our God. People are asking that today, aren't they? Has God rejected us? Whether from the pandemic of COVID, the pandemic of economic hardship, the pandemic of racism, the pandemic of the political sphere we find ourselves in. Many of us are feeling like we are in exile. And in the midst of that lament comes the voice of the prophet in our text from Isaiah 40. And there's an interesting interplay of voices here. One voice says, cry out. And the other, what shall I cry? You know, in times of trauma, people experience a sense of helplessness in terms of their voice. It, it steals their voice. What shall I cry? It's very difficult to put into words what happened and how you feel. When my wife Eileen died, well-meaning people asked, how are you doing? And I didn't know how to put into words what I was feeling. I was in a very real sense, voiceless. And in the midst of all this trauma and exile, God speaks. Comfort, comfort now my people. We are told that the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You see, when God speaks, 
His voice makes it happen. As in the creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. The glory of the Lord is revealed by the mouth of the Lord. God is speaking meaning into existence. Out of the chaos, out of the trauma, God speaks meaning. And unlike the world around us with its challenges and turmoil and times of exile, the word of our God will stand forever. Further on in chapter 40, the prophet says, Get up to a high mountain, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. What does a herald do? A herald speaks out, calls out, walks through the city shouting good news. The prophet turns to another then who is voiceless and as a herald equips them to speak, to be a herald of good tidings, to sing out with good news. But the singing is on behalf of someone else for people who can't sing for themselves. Do you know the origin of a cantor? Originally, a cantor was someone who sang on behalf of the people when the assembly couldn't sing. These days, in our gathered worship, our singing is in exile, isn't it? We're voiceless. I miss singing in church, and I know you do too. These days, in our in-person worship, Kristen is our cantor. It reminds me of a story of a member of my congregation back in Hampstead, Maryland. His name was Harold. Harold was a faithful worshiper at St. Mark every Sunday. His wife, Millie, not so much. But Harold would stand in the back of the church, for he was often an usher, and he would sing at the top of his lungs the hymns and the liturgy. Only problem was, Harold couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, but that didn't deter him. He sang out in joy. Well, Millie died after a bout with cancer, and soon after the funeral, Harold was back in church, as was his custom, but I noticed that he wasn't singing. And for a couple of weeks, I didn't say anything to him. He would stand in the back in silence. One Sunday, as I was going to the back of the church after worship, I said, Harold, I'm always glad to see you here, but I noticed that you haven't been singing. He said, Pastor, I come to worship now so that you can sing for me. Of course, he was talking about the congregation. And so I asked, who are the heralds for you? Who is singing for you? What is the message of good news that you need to hear so that you can reclaim your voice? That is what our Advent waiting and expectation this year is all about. The Gospel writer Mark roots his gospel in a moment of lament. He chooses this text from Isaiah 40 to begin his account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He quotes this prophetic voice, the herald's voice, the, one, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. You know, the truth is God doesn't necessarily fix the chaos that we find ourselves in, but he does give it order and meaning. And then God draws out other voices from the despair, from the time of lament, and turns them into the voice of good tidings. So what is the voice crying out in your wilderness? How are you being turned from devastated one into a herald of good tidings, even in the midst of exile? 
God is calling you to use your voice. He's calling us to use our voices of lament and to turn it to be good tidings for someone else. It is Advent. Prepare the way of the Lord. He is coming. In the name of Jesus, amen. Dear friends in Christ, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, now keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Join me as we confess our faith, now using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On this second Sunday of Advent, let us pray for this weary world, responding to each petition with the words, Your mercy is great. Faithful God, you teach us to wait for you with faithfulness and patience. Sustain and support us in our doubts and questions. Nurture our faith as we discern and enact your mission. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Empowering God, assist our bishops, Elizabeth and Kevin, all pastors, and all who minister in the church. Show us what is your way and where are your paths, and awaken all the baptized to the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Loving God, you set the stars in the sky and breathe life into the earth. Renew the face of creation where it is in need of your healing touch. Mend the wounds of environmental damage and restore balance to ecosystems so that all creation can declare your praise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Steadfast God, you never tire of seeking justice. Where people suffer from discrimination, judgment, and injustice, speak words of truth and comfort. Lead us toward a world where faithfulness will sprout underfoot and righteousness raining down from above. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Leading God, you ask us to make uneven ground smooth. Make even the disparities between your people. Sustain and support people with physical and intellectual disabilities. Accompany disability advocates who work for a world accessible to all. Teach us to celebrate the great diversity in our midst. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Tender God. You know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful in this holiday season. Comfort those who grieve. Be a companion to all who are lonely. Tend those who are sick or struggling, especially Joan Cullum, Patty Cutter, Ann House, Sandra Cannon, Ruth Price, Jesse Riggs, Gary Shimmer, Rita Stansel, Herma Swenson, Jean Tulene, Emma Jean Williams, 
and those we remember in the silence of our hearts. Gather all people in your healing embrace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, we pray for those suffering from the coronavirus, especially Philip Floor, Mary Ann Floor, Charles Monza, Frank Palmer, and Jennifer Palmer. We thank you for the progress that has been made in the preparation of a vaccine to save our world from COVID-19. Guide now those who will be responsible for the distribution of these vaccines. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Strengthening God, we pray for our congregation, First Lutheran Church of Nashville. As we prepare for our annual meeting, visit our members with zeal and enthusiasm for the ministry we have together and bring the wisdom of your Holy Spirit to our leaders, especially those who serve on our congregation council. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Benevolent God, grant us passion and boldness to be the effective witnesses you want us to be. Place in us compassion for others. Help others see your love within us. We pray that you will bless our program fulfilling God's purpose. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, come to us as you came to the saints. We remember especially St. Nicholas in his care for children. Bring us with them through our wilderness into the fulfillment of your promises. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Come near to us, O oh God, and receive our prayers now for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together boldly, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long expected savior, fill you with love. The unexpected spirit, guide your journey now and forever, amen. Now go in peace, prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.